Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. From ancient days to the present, mankind has believed in ghosts. Some claim to have seen them, heard them, and even touched them. There never was any question about the terror of such an experience, real or imaginary. Even today, we read in our newspapers about apparitions and spirit messages which have no reasonable explanation. It was such an experience at a lonely inn in Maine that terrified a man of exact science named Professor George Weymouth. You saw what? There, a hundred yards offshore, an inverted funnel of water like a shroud, a winding sheet, the garment of the dead. Oh, come now, Colonel Pingree, a shroud? Just the wind whipping a wave crest into an inverted cone. You look as if you'd seen an apparition. Don't tell me you believe in that kind of thing. You said your name was... Weymouth. Weymouth. Yes. That could explain it. Our mystery drama... The Five Ghostly Indians was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Robert Dryden and Court Benson. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. As we approach our country's bicentennial, we think proudly of 1776 and our independence. But what about the first people to live in America, the Indians? Long before we became independent, we had taken away their independence. Someone wrote, the Pilgrim Fathers landed on the shores of America and fell upon their knees. Then they fell upon the Aborigines. An Englishman Exploring the coast of Maine in the year 1605, captured and killed five Indians, and the bad relationship began. His name was George Weymouth, and this is the story of what happened to his present-day namesake. All right. Look at this. Indian arrow. Hello there. What? Oh. Oh, hello. Yeah. Heard you'd arrived at White Pines. Uh, my name's Pingree. Colonel Caleb Pingree. How do you do, Colonel? George Weymouth. And you don't mind me butting in this way? If you do, say so, and I'll finish my walk up the beach. Oh, certainly not. I was just about to walk back to the inn. It's growing dark, and I'm chilled. Ah, yeah. oh, that's a cold-looking ocean. Ooh, forbidding. Well, come along. We'll have a cup of tea in front of the fire in the lodge. That sounds inviting. Oh, uh, look here. Just before you hailed me, look what I found. This is an Indian arrowhead among the rocks. Well, that's unusual. It is a design on it. Here, let me rub off more of the moss. It's heavily encrusted. It must have been here for hundreds of years. Good. Drums. Beg your pardon? Drums. Indian drums. Hear them? Drums. What are you talking about? I don't hear anything. Uh, here. Any idea what this design means, Colonel? <laughs> well, they're gone. They're gone. What? You didn't hear the Indian drums? No. 
When you rubbed the arrowhead, I distinctly heard drums. When you handed it to me, the drums stopped. Yes, well, let's not worry about them. Uh, take a look at that design, Colonel. Hmm. A diamond figure enclosing another diamond figure. Oh, this is very unusual. It means medicine man. Why unusual? Because the tribe's medicine man hardly ever went into battle. He was called a shaman and had great authority because of his special guardian functions. That's why he became known to us as a medicine man. Well, you've made a remarkable discovery. Here you are. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? Good heavens. Well, what is it? Quite. The drums. And look. Look out there, about a hundred yards offshore. See it? See what? I see white caps as far as I can see, nothing more. And drums? You're hearing things, girl. Look there. Follow where I'm pointing. See that inverted funnel of water? It's like a shroud. Don't you see it? I really don't. May I have the arrowhead? Yes, of course. Well, the drums have stopped. And that funnel of water is gone. <laughs> You're a romantic, Colonel. Yes. Do you know what I'd do with that arrowhead if I were you? I'd throw it in the ocean. I certainly won't do that. You said it was unusual. My young daughter will treasure it as a wonderful souvenir. You're not pulling my leg, are you, Colonel? I assure you, I am not. What did you say your name was? Weymouth? Yes. George Weymouth. I'm an assistant professor of zoology. Weymouth? Yes, yes, yes. That could explain it. Explain what? Do you know anything about the history of your surname? No, not too much. There have been Weymouths here since the Revolutionary War... General Tad Weymouth. The name goes further back than that, Professor. I think I'd better tell you about it. Now, just put that nonsense out of your mind, Boggs. What nonsense? I saw them, and I heard the drums. Yeah. Hey, uh... I'll mention it to Colonel Pingree. Maybe he can explain it. <laughs> You're two of a kind, you and that old daydreamer. Don't know how you stand listening to his same old stories over and over again. You'd think he has a second sight. Well, some folks do, Meg. Uh-huh. Well, then ask him when he comes in from his walk where the Faradays are. Should have been here by now. Fair to six. Well, got lost, most likely. It's easy to make the wrong turn off at Bath and end up at Booth Bay Harbor. Well, I gave her very careful instructions. Seemed a nice young woman. They're staying a week. Well, we can use the money. Summer wasn't so bad, Box. And after they leave, there'll be just us and the cats. Yeah. Uh, I'll miss Colonel Pingree. <laughs> Don't see why. With that second sight the two of you got, you can keep tabs on each other all winter. Drums. Now, I tell you, Meg, as sure as I'm standing here, I heard them. And I saw what I saw. Five Indian braves dancing around a boiling pot. And dipping their arrows into it? Yeah, that's what I saw on that side road, coming back to Phippsburg from Poppin Beach. The drums were rolling, and there they were, right in the middle of the road, heads down and dancing in a circle. Oh, lucky you didn't run them over. Well, I'd best be getting to the kitchen. The colonel and that professor ought to be back soon from the beach. Uh, maybe you'd better build up the fire and offer them some tea when they come in. Uh... What's that professor's name? Weymouth? Why? Hmm. Weymouth. Seems to me... Oh, I... Boggs, now oh, what? Never mind. I'll speak to the colonel. Well, you keep your ears open for the telephone. If the Faradays did get lost, they'll be calling in. It's almost dark now. Then it's hard to find the place. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, oh, it feels good in here, Colonel. <clears throat> well, the fire will feel better. I won't change my shoes. 
My sneakers got wet. Hmm. Oh, shall I order hot tea? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. I'd like a cup good and hot. Good. Uh, uh, evening, Bobs. Evening, Colonel. Ah, that's a grand fire. Yeah, yeah. Mag thought you might like a cup of hot tea. Ah, your good wife is absolutely right. Two cups. Professor Weymouth would like some, too. Sure thing. Hey, sit down. I'd like to ask you a question, Boggs. Sure. I got one for you, too. Oh? Well, let me have yours first. You know the side road from Poppin Beach back to Phippsburg, about four miles away? Yes. Well, I told Mag about what I saw, but there's no talking to her. She just laughs at me and declares I might be a, a little loose in the top story. <laughs> well, I know that your good wife feels the same way about me. Oh, she means no offense, Colonel. No, of course not, of course not. I understand that. Well, after I picked up the lobsters and the clams in Poppin Beach, I drove the old truck back toward Phippsburg. Mm -hmm. Now, about a mile from where I turned off to the White Pines, I heard drums, Indian drums. And I saw, clear as I'm seeing you, five Indians dancing round a boiling pot and dipping their arrows into the stuff, whatever it was. You see. Well, what do you make of that? <clears throat> well, I heard Indian drums too, Bugs. I knew I was right. Where'd you hear them, Colonel? On the beach, about half an hour ago. But I saw something else. About a hundred yards offshore, I saw an inverted water spout. Looked like a limp sheet held up by two fingers. A headless ghost. What did it do? Well, when Weymouth handed me the arrowhead, the drum stopped and the dancing ghost vanished. Arrowhead? Weymouth found an arrowhead among the rocks down by the beach. An arrowhead amongst the rocks? Well, it must have been there for centuries. More than three. I'd say it dates from around 1605. Now, how the deuce do you know that? Weymouth. You're from an old Down Easter family. Does the name mean anything to you? Yeah, but just barely. Well, I've been thinking about it ever since Weymouth picked up that arrowhead. It had belonged to a medicine man because it had a design on it, a figure of a diamond within a diamond, probably from the Etchemin tribe. Back in 1605... An Englishman named George Weymouth explored the coast of Maine. For no reason I've ever been able to learn, he brutally murdered five Indians. The chief of the tribe attacked Weymouth's sloop, killed several of his soldiers, and then they were overwhelmed. Yep, it comes back to me now. Yeah. The English killed a medicine man, wrapped him in a sheet, and dropped him into the ocean. And now he's returned. He's returned, and he's called up those five murdered Indians to witness his revenge. You told Professor Weymouth about the curse? I intend to. But he's a professor of zoology, a man of science. But he'd laugh at me. Uh, how long is he staying with you? Till the end of the week. Two more days. Hmm. I'll have to tell him to leave tonight. Uh, let me handle him. If he'll give me the medicine man's arrowhead, uh, he won't be threatened, and neither will White Pines. Evening, Colonel. Here's the... Oh, there he is. Here comes the professor. Evening, Professor. Hot tea. Just what I need, Miss Boggs. I got chilled down there at the beach. Evening, Miss Boggs. Evening. Uh, thanks for the talk, Colonel. Oh. Yeah. You two been yarning about those Indian drums and them five dancing Indian braids. Oh, they're, they're, they're real enough, Meg. Now, don't tell me, Colonel, that you still think you heard drums and saw an apparition offshore. Uh, your name is, is Weymouth. Over 300 years ago, your ancestor, George Weymouth, cruelly murdered five Indian braves and killed the medicine man of their tribe and buried him at sea. If when you picked up that arrowhead, you triggered the guardian spirits of those Indians, and they have been awakened. Indeed. To what purpose? Revenge, Professor Weymouth. <laughs> I don't believe it, Colonel. With all due respect to folklore. I 
didn't expect you to believe it. If Colonel Pingree and the innkeeper Boggs swear that they heard those celestial Indian drums and saw those apparitions, why should we disbelieve them? They are otherwise normal men. Psychic phenomena is not nonsense, despite the disbelief of Professor Weymouth, whose name links him with a brutal crime committed over 300 years ago. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. It might be that some down easters have retained imaginations more lively than our own because our 23rd state, Maine, has a rugged climate and its people never forget it. In the sparsely settled wilderness, it would be easier to see ghosts of Indians from long ago in the forests in front of a blazing hearth. Professor Weymouth might scoff at folklore and so does Mag, the innkeeper's wife, but not Boggs, the innkeeper. He and Colonel Pingree know what they heard and saw. Boggs, what was that mm. talk about an arrowhead? Weymouth found it. That's when the trouble began. Oh, Indian drums, dancing Indians, a ghost on the water. Oh, you and the Colonel, you're some fair. Seven o'clock, still no Faraday's? Yeah, lost, probably. Well, you'd think they'd telephone. Well, I'll serve the Colonel and Professor Weymouth and put the other steamers and lobsters in the icebox. I think I'll go outside and look around a little. Now, you be very careful. Don't want some Indian to scalp you. <laughs> Couldn't run White Pines alone. Now, uh, one of these days, Mag, you'll believe. I'll be back half an hour or so. Keep an eye out for the Faraday. Yep, yep, yep. We can eat any time Mag is ready to serve, Boggs. Coming right up, Colonel. Good. Oh, you look concerned, my friend. Nope. Just annoyed. Young couple named Faraday was supposed to arrive at six. I haven't heard a word from him. Well, it's easy enough to get lost on these back roads. I'm going out to look around. We just got that one light out front and they could drive right by. Uh, had any luck, Colonel? I'm still not convinced, Boggs. The arrowhead is mine, but I'm reluctant to give it up. It means trouble, Professor. Uh, so you say. But I'm a man of science. Folklore is charming, but I don't believe in it. We know that myths were created to explain certain practices and beliefs. But when reason is applied, they disintegrate. As much as I'd like to believe your story about the Indian drums and the apparition on the sea, I can't. Well, then, Professor, I'll have uh, to... No, no, Boggs, not so fast. Take your stroll and leave this to me. But I... I don't know, please. And I'll say good night to both of you. Good night. Mm. Oh, I offended him. I'm sorry. No, don't worry about it, Weymouth. Hopefully you'll be away from here without incident in a few days. Hopefully? I can understand a simple innkeeper being superstitious, but I can't understand it about you, Colonel. An educated man, well-spoken. Well, all I wish you'd accept is that Boggs and I are certain that the Arrowhead is dangerous to you. It's in your own interest to send it to York to be placed with the other Indian relics. Well, perhaps. Come up to my room and we'll take a look at it. Agreed. You're making a wise decision, Weymouth. Maybe we'd better turn around, Ben. I'm sure I took the right road out of Bath. We drove through Winnegans and Arasick. We should have telephoned from Arasick to tell them we'd be late. Well, let's keep going. According to the map, Pittsburgh ought to be, well, only a few miles from here. <laughs> You'd never know it. It's like being in a wilderness. I haven't seen a sign for miles. And it's pitch black. <laughs> Scared? Well, it is kind of spooky. Well, there's nothing here to harm you. Let's drive on. If we get to Pittsburgh, we'll telephone White Pines. Maybe they'll hold dinner for us. It's after 7, Ben. We ought to be there by 7.30. <sighs> Unless we're on the way to Booth Bay Harbor. <laughs> 
have the arrowhead in my bureau drawer. I'll regret giving it up, Colonel. Well, you'll regret it more if you keep it. Ah, here it is. Deadly looking, isn't it? But quite beautiful. Uh, well, good heavens. What's that? A regular gale. And the sky is clear and the water calm. And there's fog all over the windows. Oh, look down that accursed arrowhead and stand back, Weymouth. Look out. Look out. It smashed out one of the windows. Weymouth, come here. Look. Look, racing toward the beach. I... I can't believe it. Did you see it? Yes. Yes. A white sheet flying over the ground. And twirling as it goes. Now it's at the shore. It's going out to sea. Pingree, what is it? Did you see it? Did you see it, Colonel? Hey, the wind is broken. What happened? Did it try to get in? Weymouth had the arrowhead in his hand when a tremendous gale arose. Then fog covered the window. I saw the fog. Yes. When I yelled, look out. But it weren't fog. It was that medicine man who'd come out of the sea. Well, that's what I saw from the shore late this afternoon, Boggs. What about you, Professor Weymouth? I, uh... I saw it, too. You believe now? I don't know what to believe. But you saw it with your own eyes, Weymouth. You saw the apparition, the ghost of that Indian medicine man who was killed and buried at sea hundreds of years ago. Now are you going to give the arrowhead to the colonel? I admit what I saw, but I still can't believe it. My training and my mind refused to accept the idea of an avenging ghost. What I saw might have been an illusion. That busted window ain't no illusion, Professor. Well, that might be explained in some way other than the fantastic notion that a ghost, which is weightless, could have broken that window. Now, what's all the excitement about? Box. The window. The ghost of the Indian medicine man paid Professor Weymouth a visit. What? Now, that's just crazy. You mean something that weighs less than a sheet of cheesecloth broke that window? And ask him. Professor? I don't honestly know, Mrs. Boggs. <laughs> no, you were honest enough and you admitted seeing it, Weymouth. That's true. I did see something like a shroud, a winding sheet, trying to break through the window. A great wind preceded its appearance. Then the wind died down, and the thing, twirling like a top, flew back to the beach and out to sea. And you saw it? It may have been an illusion, but yes, yes, I did see something. I'll pay for the window, of course, and I... I think I'll check out tomorrow, if you don't mind. Professor, you mean you're scared? Say I'm... Prudent. It was that ancestor of yours, George Weymouth. He was cruel to those Indians, and they want to avenge themselves against the person who bears that name. I'll give you the arrowhead in the morning, Colonel, and head back home. <laughs> About ten more minutes, Fran. I'm glad we telephoned. She was so nice, Mrs. Boggs. She'll have the steamers ready and then the lobster. Perfect. I could eat for hours. Ben. Ben, slow down. Ben, stop. What, what is it? You, you sound terrified. Look up there ahead. You see them? Huh? Don't you see them? Who, who's them? You, you mean you don't see them? I don't even know what you're talking about, Fran. The Indians. What? Indians. Five of them. They're dancing around a big pot. And listen, drums. Indian drums. Hey, come on. You're pulling my leg. Indians dancing around a pot. I don't see a thing as far as the headlights carry. You all right, friend? Of course I'm all right. You mean you really can't see them? They're dipping their arrows into the pot as they dance around it. Toledo, you must have flipped. I assure you, honey, there's nothing in the road. Nothing. There is, there is. I tell you, I see them. Hunger can make a person see things sometimes. I'm hungry, but I'm not starving to death. Darn it, Ben, I see them. Are you telling me I've come off the spool? Well, what do you want me to do? Shoo them away? I don't know what we should do. Well, I do. 
You close your eyes. I'm driving on. Indians or no Indians, I want to get to White Pines. Fair days ought to be long any minute. Yep. Now what's fretting you? Weymouth. Won't listen to reason. I'm glad he's leaving in the morning. If he wasn't, I'd tell him to get. Just because he won't do what you and the colonel want him to? There's a curse on the man. An old Indian curse. What if that thing had gotten into the room and killed him? We'd never have another guest here, summer or fall. Oh, now get that sour expression off your face. It's almost 7.30. You stay here at the desk and wait for the Faradays. And be pleasant. I'm about ready to serve them steamers. Oh, that's them, Boggs. Hmm. Evening. Hello there, uh, Mr. Boggs. Yep. Glad you made it. Evening, ma'am. Good evening. Have trouble with the road? Well, no, the directions were fine. We we just weren't sure we were on the right one. But it it worked out. What a fine inn you have here, Mr. Bach. Oh, it's lovely. Look at that lodge room, Ben, with logs blazing away in the fireplace. Fran, why don't we go in and have a drink in front of the fire? I can bring in our bags later. Never mind the bags. I'll fetch them. If you'll give me your keys, I'll pack your car off the road. My wife will get you a drink, and you can have dinner any time. Steamers and lobster. Hope you like them. Perfect. <laughs> Nothing better. All over your scare, darling? Oh, Ben. Something go wrong on the way down? <laughs> it's, it's too silly to mention, Mr. Bog. Oh. Well, I'm not a pride man myself. My wife saw five Indians dancing around a pot and dipping arrows into it. Hunger pains, I told her. Did you know? Silly, wasn't it? Depends. You better sign the register, and I'll have her come out and fix you some drinks. We'd better go down to dinner, Weymouth. Right. It's after 7.30. Hmm. Still got your appetite? Oh, yes, yes. I'm recovered now. Hmm. Quite an experience for you to tell about back home. A phenomenon. I can't quite yet encompass what happened. Well, accept it. Give me the arrowhead and tell your story on a wintry night to that little girl of yours. Of course, it's not a story, not fiction, because it really happened. It was strange. I know what I heard and saw, but there must be a rational explanation for what happened. Including the breaking of the window? Even including that. It must have been some freak kind of pressure. I have nothing to fear from mere ectoplasm. Well, maybe you don't have anything more to fear. But don't count on it. Professor Weymouth, even as you and I, is a rational man. He accepts only what he can touch or see. His mind rejects the possibility of ghosts. But is there anyone who doesn't know of a haunted house? Haunted by what? A specter? Yes, indeed, Professor Weymouth. For all your education, you cannot prove they don't exist. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The White Pines Inn is located a few miles from Phippsburg on the rocky coast of Maine. The coast is beautiful, but forbidding. As the British found out during the Revolutionary War, when 6,000 men of Maine fought them determinedly, Maine remembers those days of hardship and remembers her even earlier history. The first settlement in 1620 on the Saco River, the Abnaki and Etchemin Indians of the Algonquian family. And who is to say that the spirits of those dead do not still inhabit those huge forests of white pine, fir, spruce, and birch. Excellent dinner, Mag. Excellent. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Oh, 
Oh, very good. Best steamers and lobster I ever had. Sure. Not to forget the Indian puddings. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's real enough. Nothing ghostly about that, Professor Weymouth. You want coffee here or in the lodge room? Well, let's have it in front of the fireplace, Mag, if you please. And introduce yourselves to that nice young couple they're finishing up. Named Faraday. Yeah, I'll do that. Faraday seem as content as we are. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, Ben Faraday. This is my wife, Fran. How do you do? I'm George Weymouth, and this is Colonel Caleb Pingree. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir. Yeah. Colonel, will you join us? Well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm glad you arrived. Bob's and his wife had begun to worry about you. You lose your way? <laughs> well, we thought we had, but we were on the right road all along. And then the sun dropped out of sight, and it was so dark, I just crept along. Oh, we had an unexpected adventure. Then they wouldn't be interested. Well, certainly we would, Mrs. Faraday. Up here, anything unusual is welcome. It gives us something to talk about. Uh, just seeing new faces is a treat. Especially yours, Mrs. Faraday. Why, thank you. Uh, uh, where are you from, by the way? Uh, Lewiston. You? Uh, Brunswick. I teach zoology. The colonel here just enjoys life. Uh -huh. I suspect he's got a chest of old gold in his attic. And he's a mine of folklore about the Indians who used to inhabit these forests. <laughs> well, that's not quite true about the chest of gold. But Indian legends are my hobby. And we've just experienced another one. What? Well, it's true enough. Even Professor Weymouth has to admit what he saw. You saw something, Professor? I think so. When? Late this afternoon. Well, why are you looking so startled? Mrs. Faraday? Excuse me? You, uh, experienced an Indian legend... Four cups, cream, sugar, I'll leave the pot. No, no, thank you, Mag. Are you all right, young lady? Look kind of peaked. Oh, Indian legend. So that's it, Colonel. Got another listener to those Indian legends of yours. No, my dear Mag, I, I've Now, said nothing. don't let the Colonel pull your leg, Mr. Faraday. He and my husband, Boggs, sees things where they ain't. If they ought to give me the creeps, listen to the two of them. Say what they want to. There's no such thing as ghosts. What about the broken window, Meg? Well, that's just a freak swirl of wind. Hmm. And the twirling shroud that scudded out to sea. Well, I didn't see it. Now, I'll thank you not to go scaring these young folks. You are not going to believe this, Mrs. Boggs. Go on, friend. Tell them. Well, not far from here, when I thought we were lost, Ben stopped the car. And the headlights cut a tunnel of light far down the road. And, and then I saw them. People see things when they're hungry. Huh? Oh, maybe I was imagining things, but I'd swear I really saw them. Five Indians dancing around a pot of, or cauldron and dipping their arrows into it. You have no doubt about what you saw, Mrs. Faraday? I saw them as plain as I see you. Well, Professor... I was inclined to disbelieve you and Boggs, Colonel, but this story of Mrs. Faraday's cannot be discounted. You saw the Indians. Did you hear drums? Yes, distinctly. What? What's this all about? I... Revenge. Revenge, Mr. Faraday. What? Re revenge for what? You'd better tell them, Pingree. Now, uh, you'll excuse me. I need some fresh air. I'll see you later, Colonel. He looks terribly worried, Ben. Yeah. Because he's the intended victim of an Indian's revenge. Bob, come in here with me. I was going to turn down the Professor Weymouth's bed when... Well, look. The pillar's been rung in half. Chairs overturned. It's that thing from the ocean. I know you don't believe in such things, Mag. Well, I don't want to. But this is... Either the professor went crazy or... Well, how do you account for all this damage? First to the window. Now the room wrecked. And the pillow twisted in two. Like wringing a person's neck until he was dead. The Indian medicine man. 
Somehow he got back in here and thought he had Weymouth by the neck when what he had was the pillar. A powerful wrench. The pillar's twisted in half, feathers all over. I'm telling him to leave White Pines tonight. You think we'd better call the police in Phippsburg? Oh, they don't believe in apparitions any more than you do, Mag. Well, I'm not so sure now that I don't. Because I've never seen anything like this. Where is the professor? When the colonel began to tell the Faradays the story, the professor went out for some fresh air. And I'll find him and tell him to pack up and leave. Oh, Mr. Vargs. Like to have a word with you, Professor. Enjoy your stroll, Weymouth. I just stood outside and breathed deeply and looked at the sky. Mag went upstairs to turn down your bed. The room was a shambles. Chairs overturned, the bed all rumpled, and a pillar rung in half. What? I haven't been near the room since dinner time. The ghost of that Indian medicine man's been there. If you'd been stretched out on that bed, you'd be dead. That pillar was twisted in two. Feathers all over the place. Good Lord. I'm sorry to have to say this, Professor, but I want you to pack and leave. Tonight. I don't blame you. I'll pay for all the damage. I'm deeply sorry. Bring me the arrowhead, Weymouth. That's the source of your trouble. Until you've disposed of the medicine man's arrowhead, you won't have peace. And you may, in fact, die. Have your doubts about specters, but give me that fatal arrowhead. I'm convinced, Colonel. I'll be right back. Well, even Mag's convinced now, Colonel. <laughs> I'd imagine so. The professor's a doomed man. Not if he gets rid of the arrowhead. You think the Faradays have gotten scared off? No, no. They went to bed about a half an hour ago. Mrs. Faraday has the sight, Boggs, like you and me. When I told her what happened, she believed me. Even her husband began to be convinced. Oh, they'll stay. But you're quite right in telling Weymouth to leave. Tonight. <laughs> Stop fussing and come to bed. I'm not fussing. I'm just thinking about what the colonel told us about George Weymouth and how he murdered those five Indians way back in 1600-something. Yeah, but it's just crazy to think that some old medicine man is out to murder the professor. He didn't kill those Indians. Why is he to blame? Just because he has the same name, that's all. You believe that? Yes, I... Ben. Oh, my goodness. What is it? Look out there. On the water, see it? Yeah. Something's rising from the water offshore. It's a water spout. No, no, it's not. It's upside down. It looks like a sheet, and it's turning round and round. And it's floating this way towards shore. What is it? It's that thing the colonel told us he saw. The ghost of the medicine man who was buried at sea. It's coming towards the end. Ben, I'm afraid. I'll get by. No, don't leave me, Ben. It's on the shore and it's coming up the hill. And listen to the wind. Hey, it's coming toward us. No, no, it's heading for the rooms to our right. That's where Professor Weymouth is staying. It's after him, Ben. Ah! It broke the window. The whole place is shaking. Come, come on, friend. Let's get out of here. Oh, oh Colonel, help me! Oh, help me! The thing's got it, Ben. Colonel, Mr. Boggs. Open the door, Boggs. We have only seconds. Don't go in there, Ben. I have to. Good Lord, it's at his throat. Help me, Bob Faraday. It's, it's like canvas. Come on. Pull it away from his throat. I, I picked up the arrowhead. Bring it down. Yes, it's dragging me toward the window. No, it's twisting round his throat. Hold him down the middle of him. He'll be dragged through the window. Drag. Meg, find that arrowhead and throw it out the window. Hold the arrow. He's... He's fainted. Here's some water. Notice the wind's died down. And the thing that had him by the throat, 
It's in a heap on the floor. Uh, canvas. Look. When I touched it just now, it, it crumpled in my hand. It's like dust. <coughs> oh, my... My throat. Oh, thank you. Heard you. Ah. You had a close call, Weymouth. You're lucky to be alive. Thank God all of you were close by. Or it would have killed me. I... I'm very grateful. Can you tell us what happened? I can. I was looking out the window when I saw the apparition come out of the sea and drift this way. Then a great wind came up and the thing kind of embraced the house. It was when the window broke that the professor began to cry out. It floated in like a, a small upside-down cyclone. I tried to stay out of its way, but it began to wrap itself around me. It was horrible. What in heaven's name was it? What could it be? You know, Amos, it was the ghost of the Indian medicine men come back to avenge the murder of those five Indian braves. It was your forebear who killed them, and the spirit of the medicine man has never forgotten. When you picked up that arrowhead, you aroused his spirit. Only by giving up that arrowhead could you break the fatal connection. Well, where... Where is the arrowhead now? I threw it out the window, Professor. Oh. And something else. When it hit the rocks below, there was a burst of flame. And then nothing. I... I believe it. I believe all of it, Colonel. The five ghostly Indians... They did exist. Hmm. Lucky for you, Weymouth, that you've lived to tell the story. The dread of the supernatural goes back to earliest man. As he roamed the earth, he was encompassed by many terrors. There was the terrible dark with its countless dangers. Legends about second sight are endless. To this day, the avenging specter of the Indian medicine man lives as fact in the mind of Professor Weymouth. I'll be back shortly. The fascination of terror is as ancient as the human race. It is stronger than our intellect, stronger even than our fears. It goes to the core of our very being. The brutal, unnecessary killing of five Indians in 1605 by George Weymouth laid a curse on those who bore his surname. Perhaps there is a kind of real justice after all. Crimes of long ago unavenged can be avenged. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Court Benson, Guy Sorrell, Ann Petoniak, Suzanne Grossman, and Jay Gregory. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why did you allow her to leave so early? You and I have to talk. Well, whatever we say would be beyond her. Yes. If she's group three. Turn? How could Turn be an inspector? I suspect Turn. Because she's too perfect. Too absolutely group three. But suppose she is an inspector. What have you and I ever said to each other that's reportable? I am head of repair. You are admiral of the fleet. And we are about to be disenfranchised. Why? Corral cannot qualify for group one. He will fail the examination. But you took him to repair yourself. He was judged in perfect balance. Oh, yes. Because he was examined by a single practitioner, and I was present. Do you think he's out of balance? Oh, I know it. He's one of those. I refuse to believe that. You refuse to accept it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 
Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery.